Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the next level. This is your host, Bob Gibbons. And Stephen Nooner. Thank you for being our guest today. This is Conversations That Propel Business. And we always like to start off with something uh, kind of interesting, like a quote. And Stephen, what's your quote this week? My quote for this week is, uh, I think, totally appropriate for our guests. John Baptiste Say was a French economist who in the 1800s defined entrepreneurship. He said an entrepreneur is someone who shifts economic resources out of an area of lower and into an area of higher productivity and yield. And why do you think that's appropriate to our guest today? Well, because we have Michael Thomas, executive director of My Possibilities, which is a, uh, a nonprofit here in Plano, Texas. They employ about 48 people. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about My Possibilities, you can visit them at mypossibilities.org. But to your question, what I'd really, <laughs> that was kind of a long way to get to it, but Michael is one of the most entrepreneurial pe people that I've ever met in regards to that definition. So, so he, you think that nonprofits can be entrepreneurial? I think any person, I believe that people that are team members of companies uh, that are employed by people can be entrepreneurial. Interesting. Well, you know, one thing about nonprofits, like a for-profit, they have income, they have expenses. Uh, so in that regard, they have employees in many cases. So they're going to be very similar to for-profit companies. Uh, the only benefit they have that I see is that they can go out and ask people to give them money, you know, with nothing direct in, in return necessarily, other than, I guess, warm fuzzies. But um, I, I've tried that actually with my business. Even though my business is for-profit, I've asked people to give me money, but they seem to not want to do that. People who do you do work for sometimes don't want to give you money, right? Uh, let's not go there. I think, we, I think it's time to move right along. All right. Well, Michael, welcome to the show. We're excited you're here today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So what is one of the most fun and exciting things going on in your life this this day? Well, I've got a handful. Uh, for sure, from a from a business perspective, my possibilities is doing some phenomenal stuff. Uh, you know, we're, we're only about seven years old, but this is, I really feel like the previous seven years have sort of accumulated in what's going on right now. So we've got a lot of long-term visioning, a lot of long-term strategy that's happening, and it's, it's just unbelievably exciting. That's great. So Michael, I mean, let's talk a little bit about my possibilities. I mean, you yeah. guys, to me, have such a unique approach in, in a world that seems like we're getting pushed more and more towards independence, or excuse me, dependence. You guys are really, really focused on creating independence for the people you serve. Um, can you tell me about what you guys are doing in that vein? Yeah, you know the the population we serve is uh, it's adults with disabilities, and you know we're while the world is all about equal opportunity, this population is really thirty forty years behind the eight ball in regards to real uh, true opportunities for learning and independence. And so that's what we're doing is we're trying to provide these individuals with an opportunity to learn how to live eat, work, socialize uh, completely on their own, the same way that everybody else does. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting concept to, to think about the realm of a higher education for a population of people that are cognitively disabled. But uh, proof's in the pudding. These guys absolutely have the ability to learn and progress and get better at what they're doing. And our hope is that over time, the number of individuals that are living on their own and working on their own and uh, socializing on their own increases dramatically because right now it's uh, it's a very very tiny sliver that have the opportunity to do that. Now, Michael, you're you're serving adults with disabilities. What Correct. what about before that? I mean, what about when they're kids? Do you not serve them? 
No, we're 18 and older, and that's predominantly because the public school system, the private school system, uh, they take care of those guys through the year they turn 22. Uh, and realistically, it's somewhere between 18 and 22. A school can opt to graduate that student out uh, early if they feel that they've met their requirements. But uh, they're, they're for the most part, they've got access to programming until that time. And then, the, unfortunately, in the state of Texas, when that year comes and they graduate out of the school system, that's really it. Uh, the expectation for long-term learning drops off dramatically, uh, and, and that's where we pick up. And, and, unfortunately, there's not enough organizations, not just in North Texas, but uh, across the country that are doing that. And in regards to, I mean, I know that you have partnerships with businesses in the community and, and you, you actually try to get them, provide the skills, training and everything, get them to work. Um, what kind of work, you know, talking about audience, what kind of work can, can these individuals do? I mean, really, it's across the board, um, you know, short of I'm, I'm not going to belittle the population and say neuroscience and surgery is probably not their expectation. But in regards to the general workforce, whether it be administrative support, uh, physical and manual labor, very good. Uh, I mean, hospitality, greeting, uh, they really do. They've got a very wide variety of, of skills the same way the regular population does. And unfortunately, what you see in the working world is is kind of these stereotypical roll silverware greet at a grocery store, right. bag at a grocery store, and they're much more capable than that. I mean, we've got a, an individual in our program who's a math savant and can, can cubed root a nine-digit number or square a <laughs> seven-digit number on the fly. So if you're an accountant uh, and you need someone to catch your errors or work with you on, on fact-checking, I mean, he'd be fantastic. He'd to probably have be a great him. actuarial. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. It's, it's not we're kind of we do it backwards we say here are the jobs we're going to we're going to train these guys for when we should just be training them to to work and, and work with others and work independently and then find out where they want to be and and then go find them the job i mean it seems like there's always such limitations i mean we we, we put limitations on quote normal people in this population with cognitive disabilities it seems like that that's only compounded even more and so we we put them in a little box and that we're comfortable with that may not be the the full scale of what they could do. Yeah, the, I mean, their capabilities are are limitless, and and at this point, we're seeing while we're very young as an organization, in just five to seven years that we've seen a handful of individuals, we see the growth and development. These guys come in, say they want to work, but they need social skills development. They'll be with us a few years, and now we've got guys that are working twenty hours a week uh, in the community, not behind the scenes, and not rolling silverware. They're hosts of, of major restaurants. They're working in the front end administration offices of major companies, and they're very successful. So let's do, we're talking about limitation. Speak to, I mean, so we have a lot of business owners that are listening to this. They're trying to scale, grow their business, take, you know, bootstrap nothing into something. Um, and team and having a team and employees is a lot of times challenging enough. Um, talk to them, like what what complexities? I mean, what, are they're, they're talk to them. Yeah, sure. <laughs> about the complexities that they're that they're probably afraid of. Some great people probably think, "Boy, that sounds really great." Yeah, but we're gonna have but, to change everything. But what does that do. really look like? Yeah. Yeah, and actually, it's not as complicated as you think. There's there's a difference between modifying a job for a person and accommodating a person in that role. Accommodating is the way that the workforce should do it, and it's not a okay. Bobby has. Uh, Bobby's special needs, so we need to craft a job for Bobby. No, that's not the way to do it. Bring Bobby in, find out where his skills are, if he's capable of completing this job, if one or two things are accommodating for, accommodated for him, then that's the role. And it's uh, unfortunately the world thinks of it as, well, this person's lower functioning, so now we're going to have to bring somebody in to help with X, Y, and Z. It's usually not the case. If these guys are looking for a job, they're interested in work, Odds are they've got the skills to be successful in that job mm -hmm. if it if the environment uh, is accommodating. And so it's not a charity thing. You, you shouldn't hire somebody just as a charity case it's because they not. actually have the so no, skill. That that well, it goes that goes back to belittling the population. Hiring somebody because they're special is the right. total wrong way to do it. You hire them because they'll be a productive member of your team. And more often than not, we see the the beauty of these guys working regularly in the workforce is uh, guess what they're always at work they don't call in sick because they want to work and from a from a team morale perspective they're they're more often than not they're they're great to have around they're always up you know upbeat and mm -hmm. uh, encourages the team to to work alongside them so okay so my possibilities is not a jobs program it's an educational facility so what is my possibilities doing to 
prepare these people to great, great go out question. and get a job? Yeah, you know, part of it is uh, is identifying the interest to work. So some people say, you know what, I want to get a job. Well, do they understand what that means? Do they understand that they have to get to and from work every day, that they're going to have a boss that they have to interact with? And, and we do all of the front end vocational or what they call pre-vocational education uh, to tell them these are all the things that you need to be able to do to go get that job. And over time, as they progress through those classes uh, and community-based job training with some of our business partners, we'll get to a point where we go, you know what? He's, he's ready or she's ready to go get a job. Now let's go on uh, to the next spot and, and help them find uh, community work. Regarding your business, what, what are you most excited about right now? Well, I mean, I alluded earlier to, to expansion, and I think uh, we've, we've come full circle. We started as a, we wanted to teach, but we were kind of a day program with a few students, and we've really morphed into an educational program. And what we're working on right now is um, trying to change the perspective of what's expected for adults after they leave public school. So right now the ex- expectation is, you know, find a room, hang out, color, sit around five hours a day. We, we're trying to change that perspective for the community and, and for North Texas uh, so they realize the expectation is that they should continue to learn and continue to train and be ready for work. And uh, we're doing that by expanding into some really, really great programs. Um, over the course of the next two to three years, hope to serve more people. And we already serve about 350 individuals each week. So we're looking to increase that over the course of the next year. So walk us through your curriculum a little bit, not in detail, but sort of what are the big areas that you're training these people in? And by the way, what do you call these folks that are in your program? Yeah, so our students, we, we identify them as hipsters. And okay. this is not like the Austin, Texas skinny jeans uh, <laughs> they don't hipster. Have beards, do they? No beards. Well, no, I take that back. You have a beard. We have hipster hipsters, but those are different kind of people. Um, no, our hipsters are hugely important people. And this environment tends to be very cold with with nomenclature and names, client, consumer. They self-identify as hipster. So uh, that that tends to be uh, kind of more of a badge of honor than it is a label for people with special needs. So uh, if you think about college, regardless of your major, you had to take core classes, math, English, history, et cetera. That was what the school said. You, you have to be good at these things to be ready to go. And, uh, and then there's electives. Our core is a little bit different. It's social skills, life skills, job skills, health and wellness, which is a major component. And then we have elective opportunities as well for someone to explore music, art, drama, uh, or things they may be personally interested in. So it works very much like a college program would. Very cool. Awesome. Um, After a break, we're going to learn from Michael's experience. We're going to turn the tables. Uh, Are the challenges of running and growing a nonprofit different than growing and scaling a for-profit business? Stick around and find out. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, never exercise your renewal option. Now, I know that sounds crazy, right? Why would you get a renewal option if you don't ever plan to use it? Well, a renewal option is really just a reservation for your space, which prevents the landlord from leasing your space out to someone else, leasing it out from under you. Some options actually bind you to an extended term before you even know what the rental rate will be. But that rental option was created three, five, or even 10 years ago when you signed your lease and may not work for you today. Fortunately, there is a way, an easy way, to renew your lease without the risk of exercising your renewal option. To to learn what that is, please contact me at www.texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Want to create a breakthrough in your business or personal life? Here's a tip. Stop shopping for insurance and insurance agents. Begin looking for a way to more effectively buy and manage your insurance. At Alkali, that is exactly what we provide. The freedom you create by changing this mindset alone will make an impact. Plus, you can stop listening to all the insurance commercials on TV and radio. Unless they're funny, of course. Are you an insurance novice or just want to take things to the next level? Knowledge is power. Come join us for the single most important class that you never took in business school. We have the following upcoming classes that we teach through Collin College and the Small Business Development Center. Thursday, September 24th, Protecting Your Business 202. Thursday, October 15th, Healthcare Reform. What the health is going on? Thursday, November 19th, Protecting Your Business 101. 
To sign up or learn more, visit us at alkaliservices.com. That's alkali, A-L-K-A-L-I, services with an S, dot com. My name is Michael Thomas, and I'm with My Possibilities, and I'm helping our organization get to the next level. Though I'm not sure spending time with Steve and Bob on their radio show is going to help. Welcome back to the next level, Conversations That Propel Business. Our guest today is Michael Thomas, Executive Director at My Possibilities. My Possibilities is a day program for adults with cognitive disabilities based in Plano, Texas. You can learn more about them at mypossibilities.org. Michael, let's uh, let's get into the good stuff. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk high-low. Zig Ziglar had something that he had called the Wheel of Life, and he talked about seven areas of people's lives, career, social, financial, family, physical, mental, spiritual. And if any of these areas got too off balance, it's hard to run down at a high speed down the highway with a flat tire, right? So yeah. let's start with a high. Um, you know, over the last 12 months, um, what's been your biggest high and why is it important to you? Uh, last 12 months. So in regards to MP, we've, we've had, uh, my possibilities, we've had a handful of, of really relatively well-known and, um, uh, and, affluential individuals who have, have gotten behind what we're doing and believe in where we're headed. And in the last really, I mean, nine months to 12 months, uh, financially, they, they've gotten behind our future vision and have really propelled us to think bigger. We, we don't have a problem with visioning and dreaming. We <laughs> certainly are, are visionaries, but uh, truth of the matter is you have to have funds to support it. In the last year, we've been very successful in, uh, in bringing some of these people into the family and, and having them kind of support where we're headed. And, and so what are you doing? So tell me about that. They're getting involved and what do you plan? Like, what's your plans to, to take that? What are they contributing? What are you guys doing to try to take that to the next level? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of cart, cart before the horse. You, you go to a big, you know, big donors in the nonprofit world, the same sure. way a for-profit would go to investors and say, we got this great idea. We need all your money. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and they always can, give it to yeah, you. Yeah. Just a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> it, but the truth of the matter is that some people see that and some people really say, you know what, we need to see you further down the road before we get involved. And it's, there's no difference between the nonprofit and for-profit world in this regard. And we are to, to put it into for-profit terms, we've been seeking investors for the future of our population. And, uh, you, you just sort of have to sit down, map out where you believe you can go show your progress over the previous seven years and uh you know we've had people that see that and collectively put the pieces together and, and want to get involved so with this being a nonprofit, you you charge tuition for the hipsters but so then why do you need donors sure that's a good question uh yeah, there's a state funding system for our adults to attend the program and, and this is the worst funded state in the country. So unfortunately, the amount of money we receive to, to provide educational programming for somebody doesn't even get close to covering the cost of having a professional staff. So we fundraise to cover the gap uh, of what it takes to, to run a high quality program. And for us that right now that runs at about a million to a million and a quarter a year. Okay, so you have a lot of different donors. Some of those I know want to be anonymous probably. Mm -hmm. Do you have like corporate sponsors or somebody you can give a plug to then and say these corporate citizens are doing a great job in the community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the last, uh, last well, seven years, Dr. Pepper Snapple Group has been one of our largest supporters. They were aware of what we were trying to do from day one, and they have uh, really driven a lot of the, the growth and success of our organization over the last uh, seven years. And most recently, we've got groups like Alliance Data who are – they're very, very, um, uh, their phil philanthropic mindset is to help with job training programs, and they specifically look to support organizations that are helping adults with disabilities. And uh, they, they believe in where we're headed and what we're doing, and they too have, have stepped up to say, hey, we'd like to get involved. So, I mean, I've got a list of about 100 that I should go through, and I apologize <laughs> to the other 98, but uh, those are just two of them. Impact is a form of ROI. It's pretty Absolutely. cool to measure, yeah. Um, how about a low? What in the last 12 months, what's probably been your biggest low? Yeah, organizational growing pains. Um, the nonprofit world, maybe more than for profit, uh, we by design have to wear multiple hats, and you can only wear so many hats. And unfortunately, I think in the last year or so, uh, we've really asked our team to step up and just wear all of the hats. And it's it's really complicated to to say, hey, guess what? You're doing a great job, but we need you to do more. Um, and we've had to do that over the course of the last year. And you risk you risk uh, staff burnout as a big concern. And 
Uh, our guys are what they're providing on a daily basis in the organization is emotionally taxing. And when you step up and say, hey, on top of that, you got to do another 10 percent. It becomes rough, and we've seen some of that as we've grown. Sure. Well, and it seems like if you're really expecting your hipsters to grow and and to not just be sitting there parked in front of a TV, you, you must have pretty high expectations for your staff. How do you hire a staff that has that kind of a mindset and is willing to work with the hipsters uh, and not just go somewhere where it maybe is easier? Yeah, man, that's... Uh I think if that were easy, you would find more organizations across the across North Texas. We've uh, we've got the most phenomenal individuals, and and I call them our kind of our real superheroes. These are people that they go out and say, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, I'm going to dedicate my life to a higher purpose and to serving other people. And those are very unique individuals. On top of that mindset, they also have the skills to teach. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I don't know how. We've found uh, as many as we have, but it, I, I think maybe the nature and culture of, of who we are has attracted um, quality individuals. And I know this sounds silly, but it's just not something that we uh, we worry about. We, we know if we're going to expand, great people are going to be there and they continue to show up. Well, little, little Birdie told me that one of the reasons why you might be able to attract a, a great staff is because you actually offer benefits. We do. And they happen to be provided by my co-host, Stephen Nooner at Alkali, this plug provided by Alkali. <laughs> Indeed. You know, it's a, it's a good um, uh, a note on how we do business. We've been open seven years, and a lot of the partners that we had in the very beginning are still our partners today. And we opened with four staff, and today we have 48. So the business looks very different with all the partners that we work with. Well, and what I've really noticed about you guys is that um, you have an investment mindset, not just in the lives of the hipsters, but your team. It's when, when you have conversations and the starting point is, how do I invest? How do I, are, you know, I want to maximize ROI, my people, but I'm investing in them. That's a different mindset than when you see your people as an expense. And I right. think that you guys have been blessed by that mindset, truthfully. Well, and that's our biggest, our biggest risk is losing our team. And the worst thing you can do is say, well, you know what, we're just going to pay a salary and, and we're going to believe you guys will be here for 10 years out of the kindness of your heart. These are people, a lot of our staff are younger and they're making initial careers and they're starting families. And if we don't provide them with 403B and health benefits and time off and a, and even a bonus, believe it or not, I know that sounds silly, but uh, end of year, we're an organization that believes in rewarding your staff for doing good work. You do it in the, in the for-profit world. It's this like terrible, oh my God, nonprofits giving out bonuses. Why not? Uh, and, and we believe that our staff deserve to be rewarded and compensated and provided with benefits the same way they would, if not more so than they would in a, in a for-profit job. Pardon my ignorance. What is 403B? A 403B is the nonprofit equivalent to a 401k. Oh, so okay. essentially an investment, investment right. plan. Yeah. You can tell I've never worked for a nonprofit. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, let's move on to the next segment. This is what we call our experience impact. And this is where we ask the guests to be really transparent, give up looking good and, and kind of let the audience understand and, and learn from failures that turned into uh, successes. So Michael, what has been a big breakdown in your organization that has turned into a breakthrough? A breakdown that's turned into a breakthrough? Well, I, I would say um, in the nature of our industry, we have a lot of very passionate people uh, and a lot of type A people. And you take 50, well, if you add a board of directors, an advisory board, let's collectively, we'll say we have almost 100 people involved in the day-to-day -day at My Possibilities. They're almost all type A and they're almost all very personable, emotional people. That's really hard to manage. And uh, there have been times where just personality conflicts can't be resolved. And I, I think what we've what we've done to sort of help mitigate some of this moving forward is we've said, you know what, we're going to we're going to mentor staff. We're going to provide uh, training in conflict resolution in and uh, conflict management. And we're trying to uh, kind of empower our individuals to start having conversations proactively rather than reactively. And one of the one of the examples I always give in regards to conflict is uh, conflict isn't necessarily a negative thing. Uh, a good example would be a, a baseball bat hitting a baseball. I mean, that is positive conflict. So it's it's looking at an end as a at a individual incident and trying to find the positive. And that that takes training, not 
you know, most people don't default to that. Did he just say he uses a baseball bat? <laughs> I do. With his employees? No, no wonder they're so motivated. <laughs> <laughs> they need to talk about the radio editing here. Maybe I misunderstood that. Um, if we were all sitting here together, Michael, three years from now, um, what has to happen in your life personally, professionally, for you to be satisfied with the progress that you've made? In three years, you know, with the plans that we have in place here, uh, if we found ourselves in three years serving the same number of people in the same way, I, I would I would consider that um, a miss, a big miss, because we have the opportunity to really go out there and, and change not only the number of people we're serving daily, but also to change the mindset of this population. And, and I would say success is really nothing short of that, is three years from now, we've expanded, the world knows what we're doing, and believes that continuing to educate this population is what's expected. You know, I think that's, I think that it has to be there almost. Uh, setting the bar at, or setting it standard over the course of the next three years would be, uh, I don't want to say a failure, but would fall short. So let me ask you another question about what three big insights or revelations or whatever have you learned over the years that you didn't know before you came to my possibilities? Or before you got into business? Well, th asking three insights for me is a stretch. Uh, but I will say one of them certainly uh, is that running a nonprofit is, is absolutely no different from run running a for-profit business. And unfortunately, that's not, that's not the mindset that most nonprofit organizations have. And we really have been blessed by uh, having a group of, of leaders and board members that from day one said, you know what, we have to be we have to run this like a business and we've done everything that a business would and i tell you what that's greatly responsible for our growth and success uh, is because we do not you don't budget organ budget programs to only be successful if a, a donor magically walks in the door and funds you we say you know we got to make this work and when the donors show up great let's improve our program so going into a nonprofit in a management role, you know, I just sort of always assumed, well, we're special, we're this other kind of business. That's the wrong way of looking at it. Um, that would maybe be the one kind of predominant thing that I've learned over the course of the last last few years. Well, I'm, I'm on your board. I'll, I'll, I'll disclose that to everybody. One thing that I, I know that you're good at, and you've mentioned the word visionary before, but you dream big. And, uh, and when we are on some of the board meetings, that scares me a little bit. But dang it, if you haven't always been right. Oh, I don't know about right. I, lucky is, is part of it, too. Well, you've been willing to push everybody to a bigger dream than at least I had. I appreciate that. I, I think it also takes uh, the people surrounding the organization to collectively believe in the vision. Uh, one person doesn't drive it. It takes a team. And I think collectively we've got an amazing team of, of leaders. Michael, I'd like to thank you um, for, for being here with us today. I'd like to thank the audience for tuning in. Um, if you'd like to follow the show, nextlevelshow.com is up That's first and live. Right. I got it right. I know. I mean, <laughs> I'll get this. Stay tuned for 20 more episodes. I'll have an error-free episode. Um, <laughs> please like us. Also, we're up on LinkedIn, Facebook. We'll be announcing future upcoming guests And soon. Twitter. And Twitter. And mm -hmm. uh, if you want to know more about My Possibilities, they're at mypossibilities.org. Michael Thomas, thanks for being our I guest today. I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much. See you guys next week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.